Welcome to Denver Grace United Methodist Church. My name is Kama Hamilton Morton and I am the senior pastor. We welcome you whether you are near or far away and you can find us on Facebook and YouTube at Denver Grace UMC. Today we begin a worship series called Exodus, Wandering in the COVID Wilderness. Can you think of people who have helped you make it through a challenging time in your life? This morning, we will hear the birth of Moses and the creative and sacrificial way that five different women cared for him in a dangerous time. Our first song is an old time American gospel hymn, Bringing in the Sheaves. Composer Noel Shaw was of Scottish descent and spent his early life in Indiana, where he first began to play the violin and furnished many a dance with some music. The story goes that while a dance was going on, he had a conversion experience and ceased to play in the middle of the piece he was performing. Soon thereafter, he entered into the Christian ministry. Most of his time after entering the ministry was spent in the American West and South, and on account of his vocal powers, he was called the Singing Evangelist. Soon after beginning to preach, he began to compose and write music. Bringing in the Sheaves was one of the last songs he wrote before he was killed in a railroad accident. It was inspired by Psalm 26, where verse 6 says, those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Let us lift our voices and worship together. Hello, Grace children of all ages. I am coming to you from my home and I wanted to share something that I have here that you might think about creating at your home. So in my living room area, we have some shelves uh, that have some fun things I'd like to share. First of all, I have a shelf of animals here. I don't know if anybody else has a shelf of animals, but we've got uh, an Egyptian cat that I brought back from Egypt. We've got um, Doug's favorite, which is Sven from Frozen. We have some gifts. We have a Chinese dragon that I brought back for Doug when I was in China. And uh, we've got our Montana bears that we love. But, and St. Francis is taking care of them all. So those, that's a bit of our menagerie at our house. But I wanted to show you, I have um, some uh, shelf here. When we gather as worship or in prayer or for groups or in thinking about our connection to God and each other, 
we're going to be focusing this year a lot more about doing some of that in our own homes. We're not going to be coming to the church for everything. And so I want you to think about creating a space, whether you have a little shelf or maybe in your in your bedroom, you have a little corner of um, uh, chest of drawers or a table or a coffee table maybe in the living room that you might create a little home altar area and we invite everybody to get a candle I have a couple candles here uh, this is an oil lamp that I brought back from Tizé France a number of years ago and I've got a little candle that my good friend Sharla uh, gave to me for my 30th birthday that says peace on it. So it makes me kind of pause and take a breath. I've got, um, this is very cool. This says the best of all is God is with us. And those were John Wesley's last words as he was dying with friends that were surrounding him in his old age. And then I have this beautiful little pottery communion set that Walter Weinberg made me for Christmas this last year. So it's very special. And then up on the top, I have a little peace angel. Um, it's an angel that's holding a dove. And so that makes me think of peace. Uh, I also have a little bag that says peace on earth on it. And then another little angel candle. So those are just a few things. I would love for you to think about what you already have in your home or if you want to pick something up to add to a home altar. Um, sometimes I use fabric. Sometimes, a, sometimes we will have a, a special rock or something that reminds you of an experience that you had. Uh, it might be a little Bible or a prayer book or a bookmark uh, or a devotional book. Anyway, I would like for you, and I'm going to be thinking about this in a new way too, because we're going to be doing more of our worship life um, connected with our homes and our home life. So you can be thinking of some special things that you might have in your home. You might have one place that the family has as their kind of worship center or their prayer center or their meditation center. And you might also have a little corner in your room if you find something cool. So I would love uh, for us to do this as a congregation and to invite God to be present fully with us um, all the time. And even though we know that God's with us, sometimes when I look at these special things, I'm reminded about God's presence and also about you all, that there are people around me that are loving, we're loving each other and praying for each other and supporting each other, and we're in mission together in new ways. So blessings to you this week. Look for something to create. And as we worship, even if it's on Facebook or YouTube, and we might invite you to light a candle and to, um, to share in this together from wherever you are. So God bless you. I hope you are having a wonderful holiday weekend and would love to see you sometime. So let's pray and invite God to be with us. Dear God, we thank you for this holiday weekend. Bless all of those who are hurting or lonely Bless us, O oh God, as we are starting a new school year. There may be things we know and things we don't yet know as far as being together in our classrooms or working on our computers at home. Bless our teachers and our parents and all of those who are trying to make our learning to go smoother and as best as they can. Thank you for being with us and remind us that we are never all alone, but that you are with us and that we are connected to people all over who love us and support us. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Exodus chapter 1 verses 5 through chapter 2 verse 10, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. The total number in Jacob's family was 70. Joseph was already in Egypt. Eventually, Joseph, his brothers, and everyone in his generation died. But the Israelites were fertile and became populous. They multiplied and grew dramatically, filling the whole land. 
Now a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, The Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put foremen of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithom and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread, so much that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made their lives miserable with hard labor, making mortar and bricks, doing field work, and by forcing them to do all kinds of other cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Shipra and Pua. When you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives and said to them, Why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? The two midwives said to Pharaoh, Because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They're much stronger and give birth before any midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well. And the people kept on multiplying and became very strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all his people, Throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile River, but you can let all the girls live. Now a man from Levi's household married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and sealed it up with black tar. She put the child in the basket and set the basket among the reeds at the river bank. The baby's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, while her women servants walked along beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds, and she sent one of her servants to bring it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. The boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. She said, This must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then the baby's sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Would you like me to go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter agreed. Yes, do that. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I'll pay you for your work. So the woman took the child and nursed it. After the child had grown up, she brought, it, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I pulled him out of the water. Here ends our reading. So did any of you grow up being taught how to swim? Some of us may have been taught by taking lessons. I remember when I was young going to maybe the YMCA and having some swimming lessons so that I could be in the water safely as a child. Others I've heard tell the story where a parent or a friend tossed them in the water and taught them to swim by just trying to keep themselves above the water. While one experience is measured and thought through, the other is startling and a bit dangerous in its immediacy. One is something I may choose to do, and the other is something that's done to me. When I was in college, I spent a summer working at our United Methodist camp on Flathead Lake in northwestern Montana. And the staff, after the campers would be done for the day, the staff would go out in the dark of night and we would get into the lake. And some people would tiptoe in, ooh, 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 it's cold, it's cold, it's cold. And others just jumped in. And what we discovered was it took three jumps to be able to stay in that lake uh, cold water. 
Well, our story from Exodus today makes a huge transition in the Bible. Thank you, Reverend Mary, for sharing this beginning uh, of a long story that has impacted the Jewish and Christian traditions uh, for centuries. This story sets us up to learn about the most important person in the Hebrew tradition, Moses. Generations have passed since Joseph, at the end of Genesis, took a bad situation. He was sold into slavery. Uh, he was sold by his brothers and ended up being enslaved. And he turned it into a better situation as he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and became a trusted member of Pharaoh's court. But now it's years later and the new Pharaoh, the, the current Pharaoh, wakes up and sees all the Israelites, the Hebrew people out there, and he, they don't remember why the Hebrew people are in their midst, let alone that Joseph had been given a place of honor. Pharaoh is afraid, and I don't know about you, but when we become cornered or, or afraid of something, whether it's real or whether it's something that we project, uh, we, we can become um, just very, very uh, skittish and come up with things that may happen uh, to us if we don't de take care of it. Pharaoh's afraid, afraid of these immigrants that he doesn't understand, afraid of their language, their rituals, afraid that these people who look different, talk different, have a different faith in a different God, afraid of how they might infiltrate or influence the way things are. Does that sound familiar to anything in our world today? So the Israelites are enslaved at the hand of the Egyptians and their male children are supposed to be killed to boot. Then our story goes from the whole of Egypt down as, as the Bible often does. It starts out here and then it cones in on one family and one circumstance. This is a family from the priestly Levite tribe and we see how these rules affect them. A baby boy is born and the mother, Jochebed, is frightened for his safety. She is willing to give him up to the waters. She is willing to give him to the Nile, perhaps in the hopes that he might be found. We don't know for sure. Older sister Miriam watches from a distance and as the scene plays out on the water with Pharaoh's daughter and her maids, Miriam is a smart cookie. Uh, she uh, negotiates with the princess on behalf of her brother to have him returned to his actual mother. I ran across a little uh, letter that one little girl had to say about this part of the story, and she said, Dear God, I read about Miriam and Moses. Boy, was she a good sister to him. I hope he appreciated her. Some men don't. Amy, age 10. <laughs> well, the people of Egypt depended on the Nile River for their lives, for their livelihood. It, it was life-giving to the whole region, literally. It was for them the waters of life. And so in our story, Moses was thrust into the waters of life as a desperate attempt for survival. He was taken out of those waters by a person who decided not only to spare his life in that moment, but a few years later takes him to her home and raises him. So, people of the COVID season, have you ever felt tossed into the waters of life? Sometimes when you jump off the dock into deeper water, you have a couple of seconds where you have to orient yourself in order to survive and come up to the water's surface. Have you had times when you have felt tossed in the cold waters of life and found yourself disoriented? Can I hear an amen for the last six months? We are immersed in a time that is stretching us all 
in ways that we did not ask for. And it may feel like we keep being thrown into the cold waters. You may not have been able to recognize it at the time, but sometimes when experiences happen, perhaps later thinking about it, you realize that you came through something challenging, perhaps painful, and that though you may not be the same as when you went in the water, you ended up coming to the surface. Another great thing about this familiar story is that Moses did not make it on his own. There's an exclamation point on that in this story. Although he is lifted up as the greatest leader in the early Hebrew, the Israelite people, he never would have survived the water if it had not been for five women around him. Shifra and Pua, the two midwives who deceived Pharaoh who said, oh, we're sorry, Pharaoh, but these Hebrew women, they are just so vigorous. And the Hebrew word is related to the, the, the word for life. <laughs> and so they said, they're just, we can't do anything about it, right? They are a major part in the story of Moses coming to, uh, to the waters. His mother, Jochebed, whose name is listed later in, I think, chapter 6 of Exodus, who risked it all by putting him in the water. And in fact, she didn't just put him in a basket, but the word is connected to the word for ark, which we had in Genesis. So Moses, the baby, is put in an ark on the water, just as Noah and his family were put in an ark on the water for their survival. Isn't that cool? Ah, I know. So Shifra Pua, the midwives, his mother, his sister Miriam, who kept watch and strategically saved his life. And then of course, Pharaoh's daughter, who risked her own sense of life to save this Hebrew baby. She wasn't dumb. She would have known what the injunction was that uh, Pharaoh had given. This is a great example, these five women, of an example of how even those of us who do survive from getting wet, who do find ourselves with our heads above water after a traumatic experience, we may even thrive to become successful or inspirational leaders of others. Even those people, and those may be you, we do not make it there by ourselves. We are a people formed in community, and it is through the presence and the actions of others that we may find ourselves growing and changing to become what God has in mind for us. And this is one of the reasons, thinking about water and the symbolism of water, in the United Methodist Church, when we baptize people, we baptize in the context of worship and community. Baptism for us is not just a me and Jesus thing. It's not just about what I believe or don't believe, but it is a recognition of what God has already been doing over the course of our lives and that we are in community, that we are, so baptism is bringing us into this family of faith, that we are part of something bigger than any one of us. We are a part of the body of Christ, and it is about recognizing that God wants us to be in community. If you're curious or interested in baptism, I'd be glad to visit with you about it. Preacher John Buchanan shared this. He says, Walter Brueggemann is a very distinguished Old Testament scholar, maybe the best. He's also a great teacher and preacher, and I heard him engage a group of clergy who were there to hear his scholarly observations on this or that by asking us to recall a time when, as children, we were frightened, maybe lying in bed, sure that the shadows on the wall were a monster hiding, or the bumps and the creaks on the stairway were the presence of something about to happen. 
and we called out to our father and mother or someone else dear and near to us who appeared and took us in their arms and said, do not be afraid. Everything will be okay. That, Walter Brueggemann, the scholar said, is what faith is about. Fear not. It's the primary, fundamental, and persistent message in the Bible. It's also the first words out of most every angel or messenger sent from God in the Bible. Do not be afraid. A number of years ago, there was a fashion campaign. Some of you may remember shirts and hats and, and other things that became very popular. And it said in big capital letters, no fear. So here we are, COVID people. We are given a message every day, media, social media, that tells us we need to be afraid. Here today are a whole list of things that you should be fearful of. Echoing Pharaoh, we are told we need to lock down, to turn people away that are not like us, whatever that means. But whether you are thrown into the waters of life or whether you choose to jump in, the message from this first story of Exodus and Moses is fear not. Remember that you are not alone. You are connected to others who are also living and being thrust into the waters, who are called to live into the image of God as we have been created, so that we can do so much more when we are connected with one another than we can do by ourselves. Moses would not have made it far without those five women who sacrificially and creatively gave of themselves that he might live. This might be the difference between sinking and surviving those waters of life. How might we break the surface of the waters this week? May we prepare and imagine how we might get wet in service of our health and those around us and our community. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we enter a time of prayer, I share with our Grace Congregation the death of two of our beloved members this week. Darth Hurlbert died September 1st after being in home hospice care with his wife, Ruth, by his side. There will be a simple service at the Akron, Colorado Cemetery Gazebo this Tuesday at 10 a.m. Darth's obituary can be found at bowenfuneralhome.com. That's B as in boy, O-W-I-N, funeralhome.com. And a link will be also be in our grace notes this week. Howard Erickson died September 4th after being in home hospice care with his wife, Wilma. He was tending to cancer and our love and prayers go out to Ruth Hurlbert, Wilma Erickson, and their families in this tender time. This is Labor Day weekend, and as such, I invite us all to take a deep breath and to share in a prayer adapted from Reinhold Niebuhr. Let us pray. O oh God, you have bound us together in this life. Give us grace to understand how our lives depend on the courage, the industry, the honesty, and the integrity of all who labor. May we be mindful of their needs, grateful for their faithfulness, and faithful in our responsibilities to them. We lift our voices in the prayer Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We here at Grace are a missional church, and although we can't meet in our building yet, we are, still, we are out serving the community. I'd like to remind you that next week we'll be doing drive through communion. Normally we do communion on the first Sunday of the month, but this Sunday being Labor Day, we figured we'd have more people who could participate if we did it next week on September 13th. So please plan on coming to the Grace parking lot in your car with your mask between 11.30 and 12.30, and we will be serving communion to you. I'd also like to remind you of some mission drives that are currently going on. We're still accepting quarters for Family Promise families so that they can do laundry, and we're also accepting donations of laundry detergent pods. You can bring those into the church. We're also still collecting non-perishable food. We support two food pantries here in the Denver area, Covenant Cupboard, which operates out of Greenwood Village, and Denver Inner City Parish, which operates out of Den Denver. We are also collecting socks and bottled water for our f friends without homes who come to the Network Coffee House. And finally, next week, I'd like to remind all the students, children and youth, to please, when you come by for drive through communion, bring your backpacks and the pastors will bless them. So I look forward to seeing you all next week for drive through communion and wish you a great week ahead. Thank you. Our final song is sent out in Jesus' name, in English. The original Spanish is Enviado Soy de Dios. 
This brief chorus is a prayer, an invitation, and reminder that every day we can be part of the life-giving work of Jesus. Wherever we find ourselves, God is counting on us. Reverend Kama will share some motions to this catchy tune. Let us share this song together. Don't forget to join us next Sunday, 1130 to 1230 in the parking lot as we will have drive through communion and mission offerings and backpack blessings and a wonderful time to be with each other from a distance from our cars and to uh, celebrate the presence of God in our midst. We go next week from the birth of Moses to the call of Moses. So I invite you to read that story and we will reflect on that. But now, beloved, receive the benediction because now it is our turn to get out of here, to go into the world and to be the face and the hands and the feet and the presence of Jesus. To breathe in the spirit, the same spirit that was with Moses when he was in the ark on the waters. That spirit is with us today. So if your waters are feeling a little topsy-turvy this week, know that you are being held in grace and love and that there may be people around you who care about you, who wish to be with you on the journey. So go forth from this place to be that healing presence for someone else this week. Get out of here and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.